Vertical Alignment Part 3. We have already discussed about various types of grid, the critical length of grid. We have also discussed about vertical curves, design of sag vertical curve or maybe two types of vertical curve we can say uh, summit curve and valley curve the design considerations as approach suggested in Indian Roads Congress guideline and also the approach suggested in ASHTO. Today, after completing this lesson, the student will be able to justify the suitability of providing climbing lengths also justify the suitability of providing emergency escape ramps, understand various methods for increasing passing opportunities on two lane roads and also understand the general controls for vertical alignment as well as some of the general guidelines for coordination of horizontal and vertical alignment. First, let us start with climbing lens. So, climbing lens are used or necessary for two lane highways as well as that may be required for multi lane highways, but requirements are generally predominant for two lane highways with two way traffic movement almost in all the cases the movements are two way traffic movements. So, we restrict our discussion about climbing lanes for two lane highways. You know that the traffic movements are very special on two lane highways because multiple lanes are not available for movement and if the overtaking or passing opportunities are there or passing opportunities can be accomplished only by encroaching the lane which is otherwise or normally supposed to be used by traffic from opposite direction. So, when there are upgrades longitudinal grids, long upgrades. That time, the slow moving vehicles, particularly the commercial vehicles, they create substantial disturbance to other or the to the normal traffic movements. So, often the fast moving vehicles are forced to follow the slow moving vehicle and you find a long queue length. In fact, the reduction in speed of uh, commercial vehicles or uh, commercial traffic and because of the resulting of this thing the disturbance on the moving traffic stream or the overall traffic stream, we considered the critical length of grid. So, keeping all these things in mind, the provision for climbing length is worked out. So, let us see now freedom and safety of operation on two lane highways are adversely affected by heavily loaded trucks operating on grades of sufficient length. Remember that 
we are talking about the freedom of movement that we are referring and also the safety. The why the freedom of movement? Because often a slow moving vehicle is there. So, other vehicles are generally forced to follow that vehicles because normally uh, two lane roads the passing opportunities are limited. So, on long grades the freedom of movement is affected due to the presence of commercial vehicle as well as the grade. Why safety? The safety because we have already discussed when we talked about the critical length of grade, the more the a vehicle deviates from the average running speed of the traffic stream, more is the possibility of that vehicle getting involved into a crash, getting involved in a crash. So, there are more possibilities when slow moving vehicles are there, long grades are there safety problem becomes more acute. So, to improve the freedom of movement and also the safety of operation, climbing lanes are added for vehicles moving slowly uphill, so that other vehicles using the normal lane are not delayed. So, it is basically to avoid the delay. So, once vehicles other vehicles are not delayed, it is a better freedom of movement. But remember that a two lane highway with a climbing lane should not be considered as a three lane highway, because if you consider a three lane highway, the operation is very different. All the three lanes are available for all traffic movement, but when you add a climbing lane, the purpose is very different that the climbing lanes is supposed to be used by the slow moving vehicles to give adequate passing opportunities and improve the overall freedom of movement for traffic operation and also enhance the safety. So, a two lane road with an added lane particularly the climbing lane should not be considered as just a normal three lane road. It is desirable to provide a climbing lane on a two lane highway, where number 1 the grade, number 2 the traffic volume and number 3 heavy vehicle volume all together cause sufficient degradation of traffic operation from those on the approach grade. So, it is not a single factor combined effect of grade traffic volume and heavy vehicle volume. So, all together it is the grade, length of the grade, overall traffic volume and commercial traffic volume all together wherever they cause substantial degradation to the operational characteristics of the overall traffic stream on upgrade there we should provide climbing lane. Of course, a climbing lane may also be may be desirable even if the traffic volume is low and delay of car is only occasional. Carefully observe this part delay of car is only occasional that means, overall traffic volume is low and not that all the time a fast moving vehicle is forced to follow a slow moving vehicle. And not that all the time there is a long queue. Under those circumstances, a climbing lane also may be desirable, but it may not be economically viable. It may be desirable, but not economically viable or economically acceptable. In such situations, one should explore the other options for improving the passing opportunities. We shall also come back to that part and discuss about various methods. Now, the criteria to be satisfied to justify a climbing lane on a two lane highway. As I indicated, a climb lane, lane may be necessary even for multi lane facilities, but we are restricting our discussion about the climbing lanes for a two lane highway. So, what are the criteria that should be satisfied to justify the 
climbing lane or a climbing lane on a two lane highway. As I have already mentioned, it has to be on the basis of total traffic volume and also the volume of the commercial vehicles and overall operational service characteristics. So, let us see that. First thing, upgrade traffic flow in excess of 200 vehicles per hour. So, upgrade traffic flow has to be more than 200 vehicles per hour and truck flow rate or commercial vehicle movement should be in excess of 20 vehicles per hour. So, both these requirements are to be satisfied. Moreover, one of the following three conditions should also get satisfied. Number one, a 15 kilometer or greater speed reduction is expected for a typical heavy truck. Recall our discussion about critical length of grade where we used this 15 kilometer per hour speed deviation as a basis. That means, if it is more than 15 kilometer per hour reduction in speed from the average traffic stream speed, then we restricted or we considered that one as a basis, basis for critical length of grade. In the similar manner, in the same way, we say that do you expect a 15 kilometer per hour or greater speed reduction for heavy trucks, number one. Number two, level of service E or F exists on the grid. You know there are six level of service that we normally use starting from A, B, C, D and E, F. A is the best possible operation, whereas F is the worst and E represents the operation at or near the capacity. So, E and F practically indicates poorer level of service. F is the worst and E is just one level of service better than the worst. So, whether E or F level of service exists on grid. Number three, a reduction of two or more levels of service is experienced when moving from the approach segment to the grid. That means, when traffic is on the approach, it is enjoying a certain level of service. When it is negotiating the grid, whether the change in level of service is by two or more levels. That means, not that every time on grid the level of service has to be E or F, it may be D say for example, but if it is A level of service A on the approach, then there is you know degradation in level of service by two or more levels. So, under those conditions also a climbing lane should be justified or is justified. So, one of these three conditions should get satisfied. 15 kilometer or greater speed reduction, level of service E or F on the grid or a two or more levels of service, a difference or a reduction of two or more levels of service is experienced on grid. So, one of these three uh, conditions should be satisfied and also the other two conditions what I have already mentioned, the total traffic volume and the total commercial vehicle volume those two conditions also should satisfy, then a climbing lane should be justified. But friends, let me mention that even if those some of those conditions are not getting satisfied, still a climbing lane may be justified solely from the safety point of view. If lot of safety problems are reported, accidents are occurring, fatal accidents are occurring, so, on the basis of safety, one can also go ahead with the climbing lane. So, I have mentioned this part, safety consideration may justify the addition of climbing lane regardless of the grade or traffic volume. So, that also 
one should keep in, in mind because safety is a major, major aspect and we cannot compromise in terms of the road safety. Now, here I have shown the climbing lane. You can see that you know following the US convention of driving. So, this is the climbing lane traffic is using moving in this direction and here the traffic is moving in this direction. So, we have added one lane extra here that is what is the climbing lane for this side movement this is the climbing lane that is added. So, extra lane provide here and here in this case for both sides we have provided climbing lane. Now, the question comes where an added lane should begin. So, we are trying to explore that part where an added lane should begin. It basically depends on what is the speed at which truck approach the grid, is it more, is it less, what type of grid it is, approach, approach grid is there. Because if the speed is more, approach speed is more, you do not expect 15 kilometer per hour or more speed reduction very quickly or right at the entry of the approach grid, entry of the grid. But if the speed is less and then the truck is trying to negotiate the grid, you expect the reduction of speed much early. And then second extent of side distance restriction on approach, this is very, very crucial because side distance availability seriously controls or seriously have serious impact on safety as well as the passing opportunities. So, whether there are any restriction to side distance, these two conditions will decide where an added lane should begin. Some of the other points, where no side distance restriction on grid, right, where there is no side distance restrictions or other conditions that limit the speed of the approach, one can introduce the climbing lane on upgrade beyond its beginning. That means, climbing lane need not be introduced right at the beginning of the grid. Why? Because approach speed is sufficient. So, you do not expect immediate reduction in speed more than 15 kilometer per hour. So, there is no necessity to provide climbing lane immediately. If the approach is a downgrade approach, then obviously, the approach speed when the commercial vehicle is trying to negotiate the grade, the approach speed will be higher. So, in that case 15 kilometer per hour speed reduction will occur at a longer distance than on under normal situation. So, if there is a downgrade approach, one can expect a better approach speed at the beginning of uh, the, at the beginning of you know uh, negotiating that grade. So, 15 kilometer per hour speed reduction will occur at a longer distance. Wherever there are restrictions, upgrade approach, upgrade approach obviously will reduce the approach speed and other conditions indicating the likelihood of low speed for approaching trucks. In that case, you may introduce climbing lane just near the foot of the grid, start it early start it early. If not, you can start it after some time, after some length. Remember that the beginning of the added lane should be proceed, should proceed with a tapered section and with a desirable taper ratio of 25 is to 1 subject to a minimum of 50 meter length. Now, this tapering is necessary to make the road system or the design compatible with driver behavior. The way the driver normally you know change the lane or shift the vehicle to make it compatible with driver behavior, this tapering or the proper tapering must be done. The 
then what are the requirements of a climbing lens that means we should say the ideal characteristics of climbing lens some of the characteristics that you should keep it in mind it should be desirably as wide as through lens make it wide as wide as through lens it should be so constructed that it can immediately be recognized as an added lane for one direction of travel wherever we are providing it for one direction the driver should be easily able to recognize it as an added lane not just think that it is a three lane they should understand that it is basically a climbing lane added lane for specific purpose also signs at the beginning of upgrade such as slow traffic keep right again following the us convention if we are putting this kind of thing in india we should put it slow traffic keep left or trucks use right lane in our case indian conditions truck use left lane may be used to direct slow moving vehicle into the climbing lane and for a better efficient and safe operation of traffic and better use of the climbing lane now where this climbing lane should terminate we have discussed where it should start but then where it should terminate there climbing lane should be extended to a point beyond the crest where a typical truck could attain a speed that is within 15 km per hour of the speed of the other vehicles why this is the reason why this is said because on long grades where you are providing the climbing lane it is expected that the speed deviation will be substantial so once it has reached to the crest immediately the speed gain may not be sufficient to limit the speed deviation within 15 km per hour so you should extend it little bit so that the commercial vehicle can improve the speed have a better speed or more speed and the deviation becomes within acceptable limit that is 15 km per hour so extend it so that commercial vehicles can attain a better speed level and the deviation is less than 15 km per hour now in some cases it may not be possible so in under those conditions you decide a suitable location where you find that there will be least interference to the moving traffic stream because that is a major consideration when a truck after or a commercial vector after using the climbing lane it is joining back to the main traffic stream it should not cause much disturbance to the traffic stream should judiciously decide the location where it should cause least disturbance to the moving traffic stream again needless to mention that sufficient taper length should be provided to permit trucks to return smoothly to the normal lane here also keeping it or matching it with the driver behavior the way the vehicle moves the way the driver behaves the way the vehicle operates provide smooth tapering so that the vehicle can smoothly come back to original lane that completes our discussion about the climbing lanes now let us try to understand what is emergency escape ramps till now we talked about the problems on upgrade particularly the long upgrades where commercial vehicle movements are uh, significant the total traffic volume is significant and how to provide the relief now emergency escape ramps actually relates to traffic operation on downgrades it is not that that problem occurs only on upgrade upgrade problem occurs you know this is the speed reduction deviation in speed therefore the safety problem but on downgrade it is a different type of problem altogether a vehicle may lose control because of application of brakes there could be brake failure high temperature and brake failure and therefore eventually it may affect the overall safety of traffic operations on downgrades 
So, therefore, emergency escape ramps essentially are provided to improve the traffic safety. Remember it once again to improve the overall traffic safety on downgrade and obviously, at situations or location where the safety is a major problem. Not that all downgrades or wherever there is the downgrade, there will safety problem will occur, it may not occur also. But wherever there are safety problems, emergency escape ramps helps in improving the safety of the traffic operation. Now, let us see on long descending grades emergency escape ramps is desirable for out of control vehicles. All we are talking about to tackle out of control vehicles, while this is negotiating the grade down grade there could be brake failure. So, how to handle out of control vehicle without causing serious damage to other traffic and also to averting uh, properties and human being. Now, let us see what are the forces acting on a vehicle and affecting vehicle speed. Primarily three sources, one is engine number one, number two braking, number three tractive resistance. Now, engine and braking resistance force is they are ignored for the design of emergency escape ramp. Why? Because we should design emergency escape ramps for the most critical condition. Now, when the critical condition will occur, critical condition will occur when the vehicle is out of gear and the brake has failed. That is the most critical condition. So, if a design is safe for the critical condition, it will automatically be safe when there are engine force and also the braking force. So, for the design of emergency escape ramps, we neglect the engine and braking resistance. These two components are neglected. Now, what remains? Tractive resistance. Now, tractive resistance, there are four subclasses of tractive resistance. What are those? inertial, aerodynamic, rolling and gradient. Inertial, aerodynamic, rolling and gradient. Now, we shall talk about this four subclasses of tractive resistance. Now, inertial or negative gradient, what inertial resistance does? Now, inertia means it will help the vehicle body or the vehicle to maintain its original condition. That means, if the vehicle is on movement, this inertial resistance will help the vehicle to keep the movement or to maintain that movement. Similarly, if there is a negative gradient, negative slope, that will also help the vehicle to keep the movement. So, therefore, we can say that inertial and negative gradient they basically act to maintain the motion of vehicle, they helps, they helps the vehicle to maintain the motion. On the other hand, if you consider this rolling resistance and positive gradient, positive gradient means up gradients, upward gradients. So, upward gradients and in all the cases the rolling gradients and also the air resistance, they basically act to retard the vehicle motion. So, essentially we can say that rolling and positive gradient, they resist forces and try to overcome inertial resistance. So, one way the inertial resistance is trying or helping the vehicle to keep motion. On the other hand, rolling and positive gradients, they are trying to you know put a restriction or try to overcome that. They are, they are really resisting or trying to act against the inertial resistance. Now, what, what do we mean by rolling resistance? Let us try to develop or keep our understanding clear. It is resistance to moving vehicles at the area of contact between tires and 
road surface. Okay? So, it is the resistance to moving vehicles, carefully observe this part, resistance to moving vehicles in the area of contact between tyre and road surface and normally as to refers it uh, the calculation in terms of kg per 1000 kg of GVW or gross vehicle weight. Now, ASTO also gives exhibit showing what should be the value of rolling resistance. Now, you can appreciate that rolling resistance will definitely be a function of the type of pavement surface. Okay? So, if we consider say Portland cement concrete surface, bituminous concrete surface, maybe gravel surface, again gravel compacted, gravel loose, loose gravel surface in all the cases the rolling resistance will be different. In fact, the way I have mentioned the rolling resistance will increase in that manner. That means, least for PCC, more for say may be gravel compacted and then further more for gravel under loose condition. So, for different types of surface, what is the rolling resistance and rolling resistance because it is trying to act against the you know inertial resistance. So, we can express also rolling resistance in terms of equivalent positive grades. What is the equivalent positive grade? Rolling resistance can be converted into equivalent positive grade. So, as to gives exhibit showing for different types of surface what is the rolling resistance and what is the equivalent grade, positive grade for that. Okay? Now, if we want the grade resistance to be effective, then vehicle must move upward against gravity. It is very clear because grade uh, resistance will not be effective if it is a downgrade. It will rather help the vehicle to keep motion. So, grade resistance to be effective, vehicle must be moving on upgrade against gravity. And grade resistance is also influenced by total vehicle weight and magnitude of the grade. Grade resistance for each percentage grade is considered as maybe 10 kg for 1000 kg. Now, what is remaining is aerodynamic resistance. Now, aerodynamic resistance is basically the force which is resulting from retarding effect of air on vehicle. It is the force which is resulting from the retarding effect of air on vehicle. It is found from experience and experiments that this resistance, aerodynamic resistance is significant if the vehicle speed is above 80 kilometer per hour, but it is negligible if the speed is below 30 kilometer per hour. So, it will only become effective. Uh, if the vehicle is moving at a high speed. Now, for the design of emergency escape ramps, this factor or this aerodynamic resistance is neglected, it just gives a cushion or factor of safety for the overall design. Then, need and location for emergency escape ramps, operational problems of existing downgrades if it is observed, there it may be justified. So, on existing grades, normally the law enforcement authorities, maybe the traffic police or corporation, they will often report, their record itself will show that there are a lot of accidents taking place. Also, from field observations, one can get a trace of that kind of problem. Say, you may find the broken guard, guard rails or spilled oil, which are indication of potential safety problem on that segment. So, if such problems are reported and found, an emergency escape ramps may be justified. Now, remember that principal factors, principal factors determining the need for emergency ramp is safety. That is the principal factor, safety of other traffic, safety of the driver of the out of control vehicle and also safety of residents along and at the bottom of the grid. So, it is safety of the other traffic, safety of the driver of the out of control vehicle and safety to other residents 
who are you know located or who are residing or who are using the abutting roadland. Okay. So, that safety is the major factor in justifying emergency escape ramps. Now, ramps should be located to intercept the greatest number of runaway vehicles. So, obviously, the bottom of grade is a very, very crucial location on also at some strategic intermediate points from where an out of control vehicle could cause serious crash. So, that is the location where we should put emergency escape ramps. Now, these days gravi uh, grade severity rating system is also used to analyze for analyzing operations on grade, where a predetermined brake temperature limit is used that is say 260 degree centigrade is used to justify or to establish safe descent speed for grade. Remember that using grade severity rating system, it is possible to calculate the expected brake temperature at 0.8 kilometer interval along the grid. So, therefore, the locations where the brake temperature exceeds the limit, limit that is say 260 degree centigrade that indicates the point of potential brake failure. So, obviously, if we can calculate it at every 0.8 kilometer interval what is the temperature and then wherever it exceeds the you know permissible or limiting temperature, we know that is the point of potential brake failure. So, accordingly one can start introducing uh, you know uh, a an emergency escape ramps at that location. Again trying to you know make you uh, trying to put that point of safety or the safety consideration once again emergency escape ramps should be built in advance of horizontal cars, because an out of vehicle control will be in utter danger if it has to negotiate a horizontal car. So, it says that emergency escape ramps should be built in advance of horizontal cars that cannot be negotiated safely by an out of control vehicle and in advance of populated areas. So, that normally covers the thing. Now, there are four types of emergency escape ramps gravity type, arrestor bed type, sand pile type, three types of emergency escape ramps that are used. In gravity type ramps, paved or densely compacted aggregate surfaces are used and we predominantly rely on gravitational forces to stop the runaway vehicles. Whereas, in arrestor bed type emergency escape ramp, rolling resistance is the main consideration. So, rolling resistance is increased by providing loose aggregates and obviously, arrestor bed it may be horizontal grade, ascending grade or descending grade. Then sand pile in this type of emergency escape ramp, compose loose dry sands are dumped and normally for sand pile the emergency escape ramps length is not greater than 120 meter. Now, although there are three types of emergency escape ramps like gravity type, arrestor bed type, sand pile type, four basic designs predominant. One is the sand pile that is one type and then three types of arrestor bed. Okay? And three types of arrested bed means arrested bed with descending grade, arrested bed with horizontal grade and ascending grade. So, let us have a look at different types of emergency escape ramp or the four types which design may be generally predominant. This is ascending grade, this is the arrested uh, emergency escape ramps okay, with ascending grade, positive grade, here with horizontal grade this is the emergency escape ramp, this portion with horizontal grade and this is with a descending grade. And this last figure, it shows emergency escape ramps with a sand pile. So, this is all fill up with loose sand. So, this is the sand pile type emergency escape ramps. Now, we shall discuss about various methods for increasing passing opportunities on two lane roads. There are three, four types of measures are taken. First is the passing lane. 
passing lane is an added lane provided on one or both directions of travel to improve traffic operation in sections of lower capacity. It improves overall traffic operation by reducing delay caused by inadequate passing opportunity. So, it is basically essentially if you say this is an added lane of some predetermined design length, okay. not a continuous length, but it is a predetermined length. So, the slow moving vehicle can shift to that lane and then the through traffic lane is free for the other move vehicles which were till that time following the slow moving vehicles rather they were forced to follow the slow moving vehicle. So, you provide a passing lane so that the slow moving vehicle start using the passing lane and the through traffic lane is free for the vehicles to complete passing maneuver easily. Now, the location of passing lane should appear logical to driver, why we are saying this part? Suppose there is a long tangent, so obviously sooner or later passing opportunities may be available on long tangents, but where are in addition restriction to side distance, there the passing opportunities may be even more restricted. So, it should appear location of passing lane should appear logical to the drivers. So, that is why it is said it is more essential where side distance is restricted rather than on long tangents. So, provide it where really there are uh, you know problems or inadequacy in terms of side distance. A minimum length of 3 meter is recommended excluding the length of tappers to ensure that delayed vehicles have at least an opportunity to complete at least one pass in added lane. So, delayed vehicle should be able to get an opportunity to complete at least one pass in that lane segment or in that portion of the road. However, often uh, it may happen that there is a long queue that is that has formed behind a slow moving vehicle. So, under that case when you are providing passing lane the length should be adequate, so that most of the vehicles they can complete the maneuver or the passing and the queue length is decreased substantially. So, in that case one need to provide a slightly longer length of the passing lane, that is why it is mentioned a lane added to improve the overall traffic operations when there are long queues should be long enough to provide a substantial reduction in traffic platooning, the queue length should decrease. The transition tapper at each end of the added lane should begin or should be designed to encourage safe and efficient operation, this is absolutely a requirement for traffic safety point of view, proper tappering is required and also one must ensure that adequate side distance is available okay, at the entry and also at the exit point of such developments. Now, second is turnout. So, we have discussed about the passing length, the next is turnout. Now, turnout is basically widened unobstructed shoulder area to allow slow moving vehicles to pull out of through lane to give passing opportunities to following vehicles. Only up to that time it will pull out just to give an opportunity for other fast moving vehicle to complete passing opportunities. All these measures are basically to improve the passing opportunity. So, obviously, the basic objective is to give an opportunity for passing. So, it is basically unobstructed shoulder area the slow moving vehicle will move to that unobstructed shoulder area and give an opportunity for vehicles to pass, but this is suitable when the traffic volume is generally low and rarely there is a long queue. That means, most of the times may be only one or two vehicles are following a slow moving vehicle, 
So, provide turnout so that the slow moving vehicle can go to the turnout and give an opportunity for one or two vehicles to you know have that passing opportunity. So, it is most frequently used on lower volume roads where long platoons are rare and in difficult terrains where construction of an added lane may not be cost effective. Recommended length of the turnout including taper should vary between 60 meter and 185 meter depending on the average speed of slow moving vehicle. Now, why there is a li lower limit? Lower limit is justifiable because one should have at least a minimum length to serve the objective that is to give an opportunity for passing. So, a certain minimum length is required. Now, why there is an upper limit? Because it is not a turnout and it is not intended for places where you know you have long queue and there is heavy traffic volume. So, it is not a turnout. So, this maximum length is basically to avoid the use of uh, sorry to avoid the use of turnout as a passing lane. It is a turnout and not a passing lane. So, just to make sure that a turnout does not work as a passing lane, it is necessary to restrict its length. That is why an upper limit is there which is 185 meter. Have a look at the basis, quick look at the basis for recommended lengths, how the length is calculated. It is assumed that the slow moving vehicles enters turnout at 8 kilometer per hour slower than the mean speed of the through traffic. That is when it is entering into the turnout and the slow moving vehicle travels up to the midpoint of the turnout without applying any brake. Without application of brake, it is traveling up to the midpoint. Then to brake to stop, of course, if necessary, because not that all the time the brake application is necessary. Suppose it is just one or two vehicles, then there is no need of brake application. The vehicle, slow moving vehicle can normally come back to the original lane. But if they say one or two more vehicles are there, so and it is necessary to apply brake, so that time the deceleration rate should not exceed 3 meter per second square. On this basis, one can calculate the length. Now, this facility or this type of facility should not be located on or adjacent to horizontal or vertical curves that limit the side distance. So, why to invite again the safety problem? An available side distance should be at least 300 meter on the approach of the turnout. So, obviously, we do not allow it where the side distance restriction is there and a minimum of 300 meter side distance is required on the approach of the turnout. Now, shoulder driving. Shoulder driving is another way of improving passing opportunities where slow moving vehicles move to shoulder, it is a normal shoulder, no nothing not extra, uh, no extra widening essentially and return to travel way after passing of the following vehicles. So, shoulder function as a continuous turnout. Now, this improved passing opportunities without a major capital investment cost, but please do remember that in many states shoulder driving is not permitted. That means, not permitted by law. So, if you are allowing shoulder driving or this kind of you know opportunities can be taken to improve passing opportunities only where shoulder driving is not prohibited by law. Some of the other points, logical derivation that if we are allowing shoulder driving, then adequate structural strength must be there for the shoulder to support vehicle weight. And also remember that once shoulder driving is allowed, it cannot be limited to selected site, it is very difficult to enforce that. So, what will essentially happen? It will occur anywhere on paved shoulder. So, keeping these things in mind, one should decide whether to go ahead with the shoulder driving. If shoulder driving is allowed, a minimum of 3 meter width is necessary for the shoulder, preferably 3.6 meter. And last but not the least, effect of shoulder driving on bicyclist must be considered. Shoulder driving, once it is permitted, this should not cause potential safety problem to bicyclists. 
So, impact of shoulder driving on bicyclists should also be explored. So, these are all the points adequate shoulder strength, minimum width and effect of shoulder driving on bicyclists and also uh, remember that once it is allowed it will occur everywhere on paved shoulder. So, keeping these things in mind considering these things uh, keeping these things into consideration one has to decide whether the shoulder driving can be allowed. Last one is shoulder use sections. Now, shoulder use sections it is shoulder driving anywhere and everywhere it will occur. Now, for shoulder use section it is permitted or overtaking or passing is permitted only at selected sites designed by specific signing. So, only at selected sites designed by specific signings saying that yes overtaking is allowed here only at those locations overtaking can take place and that is what we understand by shoulder use sections. It is a limited application of shoulder use because we are not allowing it everywhere only at selected points where adequate shoulder strength is available and it is permissible or it can be allowed without other disturbances or safety problem there only we are allowing, but it essentially functions as extended turnout because turnout also we do like that a very similar thing. So, it functions like an extended turnout. Here also minimum width of 3 meter is required for shoulder use sections as well as for shoulder driving like we did for shoulder driving and preferably 3.6 meter and also adequate structural strength of shoulder where shoulder use section is provided. It must have shoulder must have adequate strength. So, these are the all four different methods that may be applied to improve the passing opportunities. Now, some of the general controls for vertical alignment a smooth grade line with gradual changes is preferable rather than with numerous breaks and short tangents often it gives a better profile the roller coaster or hidden tip type uh, that is uh, short vertical curves within a continuous profile should be avoided by the use of horizontal curves or by more gradual change. Because if there is a hidden dip obviously, vehicle when it is approaching it may not recognize that inside that valley curve or inside the dip there is another vehicle. So, suddenly he finds the vehicle is there. So, that type of design should be avoided. If we provide a horizontal curve, horizontal curve again provides restriction to side distance, so drivers become cautious or a smooth or gradual change in grade. A broken back <coughs> grade line should be avoided and replaced by a single curve. This point we also mentioned when we talked about the horizontal alignment. Deck of small cross drainage structure should follow the same profile as of the flanking road profile without any break in the grade line it should match suppose we are we are providing a grid we, we are providing a road profile. So, if there is a cross drainage structure here that cross drainage structure that also it match should match with the overall profile of the road. On long upgrades it is preferable to place the steepest grid on the bottom and flatten the grades near the top of the ascent or to break the sustained grade by short intervals of flatter grade rather than providing a uniform sustained grade slightly below the recommended maximum. This is just to provide a relief to the traffic continuously negotiating a steep grade. So, instead of that provide a steep grades give a relief then again provide a bit, bit steep grade provide a relief. So, that operation becomes more easy and more you know comfortable for the you know commercial vehicles or heavily loaded vehicles where at grade intersections occur on roadway sections with moderate to steep grades it is desirable to reduce the grade throughout the intersections. When you are approaching or meeting an intersections, intersections approach grade must be designed very carefully and it should be controlled. Sag vertical curves should be avoided in cuts needless to mention that because obviously, if we are using sag vertical curves in, in cuts it will invite drainage problems. So, very very special attention is required for drainage consideration. Now, some of the general points about the coordination of horizontal and vertical alignment 
ultimately the road is a three dimensional uh, profile you know it has got x y z dimension so we have talked about the horizontal alignment talked about the vertical alignment but the overall coordination the overall three dimensional profile is very important so it should be it should complement horizontal and vertical uh, profile should complement each other with proper coordination sharp horizontal curves should be avoided at or near the apex of the pronounced summit or sag vertical curves for safety consideration curvature also should be designed properly okay both horizontal and vertical curve should be made as flat as possible and to give a overall better three dimensional set now some questions for you to answer when a climbing lane is justified on two lane road mention different types of emergency escape ramps used for mitigating operational problems on downgrade and discuss various methods for increasing passing opportunities on two lane roads try to answer to these questions we will discuss the answers during the next lesson now before i close let me quickly try to answer some of the questions what i raised in the uh, last lesson define critical length of the gauge and discuss the basis by ashto it is basically the maximum length designated on upgrade where a loaded truck can operate without an unreasonable reduction in speed and as per ashto a 15 km per hour speed deviation is taken discuss the design control for crest vertical curve it is basically side distance is the problem so side distance consideration two cases are there a length of the curve greater than ssd less than ssd in both cases we can calculate the required length and here the reciprocal that is uh, k factor is defined which is basically the distance needed to make 1% change in gradient and accordingly ashto provides the exhibit to help us to calculate the length of the curve under various conditions for different k value k for drainage is also another requirement which does not restrict the design but ask you to be little bit more careful then the criteria considered by ashto for establishing the length of the vertical curves we consider the headlight side distance again calculate the length depending on whether l is greater than side uh, stopping side distance or less than stopping side distance also second one is the passenger comfort third one is the drainage control and forward fourth one is the general appearance but generally it is the headlight side distance consideration that governs the design or the design length of the valley curve that completes our discussion thank you